Do you ever notice this? Uh, you Christians or have been around following Jesus for a while. Do you ever notice um, Christians have a tendency to get uh, weird when they talk about spiritual things? Do you ever notice that? Do you ever talk with somebody and then when they start talking about something spiritual, then all of a sudden the conversation turns a little bit weird? I don't know if you ever notice that. Maybe it's just me. Um, it seems like sometimes uh, Christians, you know, for probably good reasons, uh, but anytime they get a, a strange or odd thought in their head, there's a tendency for Christians to say, oh, this must be from God, as if God's the one that's giving you these strange and, and weird thoughts. And I wonder if we could, maybe, maybe we should stop blaming God for the strange things that we think sometimes. I think uh, we would do, uh, uh, all of us, a lot of, uh, we would do God a favor by stop blaming him for those things. When I first uh, started to become interested in God and, and uh, trying to find out what Jesus is all about, I was living in Tennessee at the time, and uh, I, was, uh, I, I got a job um, selling uh, merchandise for Carmen. Carmen's a, music, a Christian musician. Does anybody remember Carmen? It, 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 some people, if you're around in the 80s and 90s, you know Carmen. Carmen's like a, the evangelical Neil Diamond kind of type. Uh, and I got a job with him, and we'd, we'd travel around. We, like, I would do anything. Uh, but I would travel around with his uh, band and everybody, and we'd, we'd travel the United States putting on concerts, and he'd put on the concerts. I would sell the merchandise. Um, and I remember going to this one. We were in Florida. We were at this uh, venue in Florida, and uh, the security kind of warned everyone as we're setting up everything for the concert in the, uh, at that night. They said, keep an eye out. There's a, there's a woman that's uh, walking around who said she's got some kind of revelation from God. Um, and she, wa she really wants to meet Karma, but we're, we'll keep an eye out for her because something's, something's a little off with this lady. And so I was like, okay. Uh, later in the evening, I see this, this woman walking up with a wedding dress. She's got a wedding dress on, and she comes up and she says, where's Carmen? Where's Carmen? I've got to meet him. And I said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure he's, you know, he's busy. I, don't, I, I just sell the T-shirts. You want a T-shirt? Uh, and, uh, and she said, well, I got a revelation. God told me I'm, we're supposed to get married. We're supposed to be, I, I need to marry him. And I just remember thinking, even as a new Christian, boy, I'm, I wonder why God didn't tell Carmen that. It seems like an important thing <laughs> that he would tell him as well. And, uh, and so, the, you know, this lady, and then the security came because, uh, you know, everybody's kind of concerned at this point. Well, the next day, uh, we had to drive all the way through the night, and we went up, and the next show was in Massachusetts. And uh, we get set up in Massachusetts, and as we're setting up, here's this woman again who has, who has followed him from Florida all the way to Massachusetts. And she says, God, I'm supposed to marry Carmen. I'm supposed to marry Carmen. And I remember thinking, uh, as a new Christian, why is God telling people to do all this weird stuff? <laughs> why, why is it any time people have these weird ideas that uh, they say God is telling them to do this? Um, I'll notice this, people will say things like, uh, you know, God, I feel like God's telling me I'm supposed to leave my husband or leave my wife. I, people say stuff like that. And I feel like sometimes we, we must be using this as an excuse for just our, our bad and weird behavior. Um, usually it's when, you know, we, we feel like we want to break a commandment or something, we'll say something like, well, I, th I feel like God's telling me it's okay. I feel like God's telling me that uh, I have a, an exemption from this one. Um, listen, if God is going to tell you anything, he's not going to go against what he's already told us in Jesus. If God's going to tell you something, it's not going to be something opposite of what he's already said to do. Um, we, we often hear this, uh, you know, we, we hear of people, and I don't want to get too far into this, but, you know, we often hear of, see people, Christians, acting strange and doing strange things, and uh, people say, well, they're, they're, they're just filled with the Spirit is why they're acting so strangely. Well, sometimes maybe that's the case, but hold on a second. Um, let's look in the Bible and see what being filled with the Spirit looks like. I mean, we, we need to have some kind of basis, some kind of foundation before we go off and give excuses to all sorts of weird behavior. Um, Here's what I know about God. Uh, God is the God of peace, not of confusion. He's the God of order, not of disorder. He's not a God of chaos and, and weirdness. The fruits of the Spirit, um, it says in the Bible, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and the last one, self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. If someone is filled with the Spirit, then they're going to have more of these things. That's what we need to look for. More peace, more patience, more self-control. Um, 
keep that in mind when, uh, when people talk about spiritual things, because there's a lot of weirdness out there. Um, we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare for the next month or so. This is a topic, spiritual warfare, and it's an extremely important topic. Um, but as I was researching for this, uh, this series, I found out, boy, there is a lot of silliness about this topic out there. There's a lot of silliness and fear-mongering and a lot of weirdness. Um, so I urge you, as we talk about this topic, and as you hear about it from people, including myself, um, examine these things. Check these out. Read, keep, read your Bible. Say, when people say something about spiritual warfare, when I say something, when people say something about spiritual things, um, ask, where is that found? Where, is, is that in the Bible somewhere? Can I read about that? Where, where, where are you getting this? Or is this just kind of your own ideas? Like I say, there's so much, um, it's just really nonsense ar around this topic. I want to really be careful. Uh, the fact is, when we talk about spiritual matters in the spiritual realm, the fact is, we really don't know a lot. We really don't know a whole lot about it. We get glimpses of it in the Bible. We get glimpses of it uh, as we listen to the words of Jesus, but that's about it. And because we just get these glimpses, um, people take th this, the opportunity to create their own theories and to create their own kind of elaborate system of, of rituals and, and things like this um, because there's just so little we know about it. So as we get into this topic, I want to war get two warnings for you before we begin. First warning is, don't get too wrapped up in the spiritual stuff uh, to try to find out more. Uh, God only gave us a little bit, and let's be content with what he gave us and, and stand firmly on that and try to, instead of trying to go off and figure out our own things. So that's the first warning. Don't get too wrapped up in it, trying to find out the esoteric stuff. Uh, the second warning is, be careful and be sober-minded. Um, don't ignore the spiritual stuff. I think there's the pendulum thing that Christians tend to do. There's either the people that go all out and get all weird on you, or then there's the people who just totally ignore it and, and don't do anything about it. So let's try to find a good balance point. Let's be careful. Let's be sober-minded as we look at this stuff. So my goal as we talk about spiritual warfare this coming month is really to just to try to get us to start thinking differently about this whole topic. Um, so don't be expecting a lot of weird stuff, a lot of weird <laughs> ritual. You'll be disappointed if that's kind of what you're looking for. Uh, but I'm not interested in that stuff. I'm interested in what has God said? What, is, what can we uh, stand on um, in terms of truth? Now the scripture we're looking at this, uh, this week is a passage from 2 Kings chapter 6. And it's a really interesting story. Something that happened with the Old Testament prophet Elisha. Elisha was the prophet that was around after Elijah. And um, there's this interesting story that 2 Kings 6 tells, and I put there in the introduction. 2 Kings 6 gives us one of these little peaks behind the scene. It gives us a peek behind the scenes. Elisha is on, um, he's on the scene, and he's uh, going around, he's being, you know, he's doing his prophet thing. And uh, one of the things he does, he's talking with uh, the king, and he says, hey, these Arameans, these, these people from the kingdom of Aram, are, are out to get you. And you have to be careful where you're going, king, because they, they want to take you over. And so um, as the king goes out, he will send out people to kind of scope out the place and see if the Arameans are there. And then the Arameans are there, so the king will go off somewhere else. Well, this frustrates the king of the Arameans because he's saying, I'm trying to, you know, Con I'm, I'm trying to take this king over, and, uh, and he seems to know where we are. And so he thinks there's a spy within uh, his ranks. And people say, you know what? No, there's not, there's not a spy. No one's telling him the information. They've got a prophet from God, and this prophet has warned the king of what we're trying to do. And so the king finally, uh, in frustration, gets fed up, finds out that the king of Israel is staying in the city of Dothan, and he sends his armies over, and he surrounds the city. And the servant of the king wakes up and talks to Elisha, and everybody's really scared because the Arameans have surrounded the city. Now it seems like they've evaded the king for a while, but now they're stuck. And this is, these are the verses that uh, we're going to pick up on in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. It says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And Elisha prayed, and here's Elisha's prayer, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the servant, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Interesting story. Let's pray as we get into this. Lord, I pray that you would be with us and guide us. Um, I pray that you would... Um, be our foundation, that we wouldn't go off seeking uh, strange and interesting things just for the sake of strangeness and newness, Lord, but that you would keep us grounded. Uh, God, you are the way and the truth and the life, 
Help us be focused on you as the God of truth um, and help us be content with what you've given us. Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts uh, as well as the, you've opened the eyes of this servant here to help us see the spiritual realities behind this world. And we ask for your guidance today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, here, like I said, I, uh, we have an interesting peek behind the scenes. The Elisha prays and the servant opens up his eyes and instead of the kingdoms of the, uh, the, the army of the Arameans who surrounded the city, he also sees this heavenly army that's also around them. Chariots of fire and angels. He sees that um, they're not alone here uh, having to face the Arameans. Um, he sees that God's armies are out there too. And it's something that he didn't realize before, the servant. Um, and I think it's a beautiful story. Elisha can remain calm because he knows, you know, even though my, this city is surrounded by these Arameans, God's armies are so much bigger than this. And why am I worried about this when I know that God's armies are so much bigger than this battle that I'm facing here? And Elisha can remain calm. And here's the interesting thing I think about this story. That when Elisha prayed, he didn't pray, Lord, send your armies here. He just said, open, open the eyes of this person so he can see the armies that are already there. I think that's an amazing thing about this story. It's not that the armies showed up after Elijah prayed. What, the amazing thing is the armies of God are already there, already present. The only thing that changed was this servant could now see them. That's the thing that is comforting to me, that even though we can't see these things, even though we can't see the Lord with our eyes, um, it's comforting to know that God is, I thought that was me, I was like, uh-oh. Um, it's comforting to know that God is here and always is here, whether we can see him or not. But the thing we need to remember is that there are real armies, like real physical armies, and there are also spiritual armies. And these things aren't separate. These are, these are one and the same thing. It's not as if God's spiritual armies are off somewhere in heaven doing their spiritual thing and who knows what they're doing, but, and we have our own business down here. No, God's armies are in, intimately involved with what's going on here in the world. So we don't have our things that's going on and then God's off doing his own thing. God's working and our working are one and the same thing. And we've got to stop this thinking that some things are spiritual and then some things are natural or normal. We've got our own normal, regular, everyday lives, and then there's the, then there's the spiritual, which is, which is off somewhere, uh, and that these things are separate. We've got to stop thinking that way. Um, God's not off somewhere doing weird supernatural stuff, and we're doing our normal, everyday stuff. Um, these are one and the same thing. Uh, I remember working, uh, just a few months ago, I was working at... Uh, I had a job doing a title insurance, and I was on my computer, and I'm putting in, inputting these files into the computer. And as I'd get to the one specific part of inputting these files, um, the program would crash. And I, I was like, okay, this is frustrating. So I got to start up the program, get the file, start the file, in, and at the same spot in the same file, the program crashed again. Now, after a few times of this, I'm starting to get really frustrated, and I'm thinking, this is so irritating. This file should have been done five minutes ago. It's taking me an hour. And so I get to the same port, part in the program where it crashes. And before I hit the button, I say, okay, Lord, please don't let this program crash. I'm so frustrated. And I hit the button and it didn't crash. I thought, oh, okay. Thank you, Lord. That's an answer to prayer. So I get the next file. I'm putting the next one in. Hit the button. Crashes. Oh, shoot. I forgot to pray. So I open up the program again. I'm entering the, entering the file and get to the part. I say, Lord, please don't make this crash. Click the button. Doesn't crash. I was like, okay, this is great. Lord, thank you. This is a great, uh, a great su prayer success rate. Uh, I normally don't have this success rate with you. Uh, so I open up the next file, put it in, um, get to the point, pray, hit the button, goes, and it goes through. And so I do it every time. And, and I notice every time I pray, it doesn't crash, and I get to go. And every time I, uh, wait, did I say that right? Every time I do pray, it doesn't crash. But every time, all those times that I don't pray, it crashed every single time. I remember thinking, God, you're, what's up? Something's up here. And everybody in the company is complaining. Oh, I'm so sick of this program. It keeps, keeps crashing. And Chad, what, how are you able to do this? I remember thinking, well, <laughs> it's going to sound weird, guys, but I, I pray, and then it seems to work. And everyone's like, whatever, what a weirdo. Um, but it did. It just worked every single time. Now, come to find out uh, what was happening with this program was um, if you would click this button before the whole thing loaded, uh, it would crash. And so when I took that time just to pray, what was happening was the program was finishing loading, and then I, and then I hit the button and everything was fine. So that's, that's what was happening. And so 
th so here's the question I'm going to ask you guys. Was that a miracle or was it not a miracle? Now, if, you're, if you were like me before I knew the Lord, I would say, well, clearly this is not a miracle. I mean, this is just, you know, the, the program just needed to load, and that was, that was it. But um, if we're thinking spiritually, and not, and not thinking, well, miracles are some weird things that we just can't explain, but if we're thinking that God is at work in the world now, um, that these two aren't separate things. We don't have to think, oh, well, yeah, that really wasn't a miracle because I can explain it. Um, no, it was a miracle. Uh, I prayed to God and he did answer it. We shouldn't be thinking like, oh, well, some things are miracles and, and some things aren't. Some things are God working and some things aren't. God's at, God's at work whether you understand how it works or whether you don't understand how it works. And I think we need to stop the separation of you know, the spiritual and then the, the non-spiritual. We have this definition of miracle that is, uh, a miracle is something that we can't explain. Um, we really need to lose that idea. There's no distinction between uh, whether you can explain it or whether uh, you can't explain it. Uh, it. It can be a miracle either way. Um, we, we have this uh, thinking that God, of God, is something like a pie. And I got a picture of a pie here for you. Um, yeah, this is, how, this is how we tend to think of God. Um, God at work in the world. There's a certain uh, amount of things that God does, a certain amount of pie slices that God does, and then there's a certain amount of pie slices that just happen. They're just natural. They're, science can explain them. And the more things we understand of science, uh, the less that God really has to do. And this is kind of our thinking about how God works in the world. I know this is my thinking um, growing up and everything. And I think we came up with this idea to try to help God, to try to give God something to do. Because we see all these things and these kind, of, these kind of happen naturally. And we think, well, what is God doing then? Well, God must be doing something. So we'll give him this little piece of the pie here. Here's the problem with thinking of God like a pie. Um, the more we find out and the more we understand, that part of the pie is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And God's part of the pie is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is the way the, a lot of our culture tends to think. And finally, you get to the point where God's part of the pie is so small, you think, well, I guess I don't really, we don't really even need God anymore. Because all the rest of the stuff happens without him anyway. Um, so maybe God's not even there at all. That's the problem with pie thinking. We want to get away from pie thinking. Um, it's not as if there are some things that God doesn't do and then there's some things that God does do. It's all God. We need to instead have cake thinking. Here's a picture of a cake. Um, with cake thinking, you have a layer of, say, scientific understanding, and the whole thing, it can be a scientifically understood or whatever, physically understood, but then underneath it, you've also got the spiritual layer. So there's not like, a, there's a part of the cake that's, uh, well, this is the science part of the cake, it's not the God part of the cake. Uh, no, you, with a, ca a cake has layers, and we have to have an understanding of God that um, no matter how much we understand or how much we understand of how the world works, um, God has his layer too the spiritual layer, but it's all the same thing. And so this way, uh, we don't have to box God out of the things that he's doing. We can say God is a part of the entire thing. And also, we don't have to be afraid of discovery and knowledge and science the way uh, some believers do, because we think, well, if we find out too much, then what will, God, what will there be left for God to do? Well, that's pie thinking. We need cake thinking, where no matter how much we figure out how it actually works, we can also give glory to God and say, well, this is amazing that you have it work this way, Lord. This is amazing that you um, are, are working this way. As we look out into the uh, solar system and the universe and we see all the stars and we're amazed, um, there's some people that say, well, the more we understand about that, we don't have to have God at all. No, the more we understand about it, the more glory we need to give to God to say, God, this is amazing that you do all this. And every time there's a scientific discovery, we need to say, God, that's amazing that you set it up that way, that we're just now discovering this. That's amazing that you've worked that way. But we need cake thinking, not pie thinking. Um, and this is going to help us when we talk about spiritual warfare. Because we're, we're not just talking about, when we talk about spiritual warfare, we're not just talking about demons and angels somewhere doing some weird battle somewhere uh, that doesn't affect us. That would be like a, a spirit warfare, spirits fighting against each other. We're talking about spiritual warfare, just a different way of looking at things that are already going on in our lives. Like the angels of Elisha. Those angels of Elisha that the, the servant saw, they're not off doing their own war somewhere. Um, they're there working in the war that's going on here and now. Um, spiritual warfare isn't some weird thing that happens somewhere else. Spiritual warfare is what you are in right now. You are in a spiritual warfare. Um, 
And here's the big thing I want you to remember today, that spiritual warfare isn't this weird thing that some people do and some people don't. Uh, spiritual warfare is every day. It's your life. It's what's happening. And we need to wake up to the fact that we're in a spiritual warfare, that we are spiritual creatures living in a spiritual creation. Um, Jesus painted a picture, I put in your insert, Jesus painted a picture of two kingdoms at war. And this is an important thing to remember. Jesus painted a picture of two kingdoms at war. There's not just heavenly armies that Elisha and the servants saw. There's not just those heavenly armies. The enemy has armies too. The devil has armies too. And you need to know this, that you have an enemy and that you are under attack. Because a lot of us don't think about this. Um, the, the, another story that peeks behind the scenes in the Bible uh, is in the book of Daniel. And Daniel's a prophet and he's praying at one point. He's reading his Old Testament and he, he's having uh, some trouble understanding it. So he prays to God. And uh, a couple weeks later, an angel comes to him. He sees, he sees a vision by this angel. And the angel says, you know, I would have got here earlier, but I had a, I had a fight going on. And then he kind of goes on and explains. And you think, what in the world's going on? <laughs> That's another peek behind the scene. But this peek behind the scene clearly tells us there are spiritual realities at work in our lives. Not just God's, but also the enemy's. And this idea of the kingdoms at war needs to shape our understanding of the world and our place in the world. Um, sometimes when I go out walking, I'll, uh, I go out walking to try to get close to God, and it, it really helps me greatly. Uh, sometimes at night, I'll look out at the night sky, and I'll just be amazed at the creation. And sometimes I'll think, I wonder what Jesus thought when he walked out at night. Because the Bible talks about him going alone off into the mountains, going alone and being with God. And as Jesus looked up at the sky, I wonder, man, how did Jesus think about creation? Well, here's how he thought about it. He thought that God's good creation was under attack from the enemy. All his messages uh, were focused on this, this idea that um, the creation is in rebellion against God, that the enemy is in rebellion against God. And all these things, the sicknesses, the, the demons, even the natural disasters were all a part of this battle that's going on. Jesus sees a good creation that God created, but he also sees, boy, it's under attack. And if I'm not prepared for this, uh, then I'm going down. And he would go off and he would pray and he would get the strength from God because he knows this life isn't a picnic, it's a battle. And God's creation is being rebelled against. Um, I lost my spot, I'm sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, excuse me. Uh, if this uh, sounds strange to you, um, I, I totally understand because it is, it is a strange thing. You think, oh, boy, I don't, I don't know if I get this. I don't know if I am, I'm fully on board with this idea of the spiritual stuff. Um, try this this week. Try thinking uh, of reality in these terms for a week. And I think you'll find a lot more things are going to make sense. When you go out in your life and you think to yourself, um, God's creation is under attack, um, I think you'll find that this really does make a lot more sense of things. In fact, this kind of thing should be obvious to us. When we look out in the world and see the senseless violence and the evil uh, in the world, it should be obvious to us that there's some kind of attack going on. And sometimes we try to explain it away, we Christians try to explain it away by some weird thing that God's doing. We see some uh, terrible senseless evil, we, we uh, encounter some tragedy and we think, well, God's got, you know, I guess God's doing something strange, I just don't really understand. Well, we, we say this because we're trying to help God out, but we don't realize the kingdom of the enemy is in rebellion against God. And there's senseless acts of violence in this war. And it's not God orchestrating every single one of these things. Uh, it's that he's given freedom to his creation, and there are people in an entire spiritual reality that are in rebellion against him. And we're existing in the middle of this tension, in the middle of this war. Uh, and in war, we have senseless tragedy, and it's, but it's not God causing it. God's saying, I'm, tr I'm making everything new. I'm trying to renew everything. I'm wiping that evil out. I'm erasing it and bringing in my own kingdom. I'm starting again. Um, thank you for trying to um, exonerate me by saying, well, God's causing this for some reason we don't understand. But really what God's doing is uh, he's trying to wipe out the rebellion and start up a new creation, uh, a new kingdom. I put there in the insert, we live in a battlefield. Here's the problem with us. We live in a battlefield and we don't even realize it. So we're, we are so quickly running through our lives, going from one point to the next. We wake up, we get our breakfast, we get in the car, we go to work, whatever, we get the kids ready for school. We go through our lives and we don't even give it a second thought. 
We don't always say, well, I don't have time to think about this stuff. Well, guess what? Whether you have time to think about it or not, you're living in a battlefield. And your kids are living in a battlefield. Maybe you should wake us up to the reality of this thing. And I'm not, trying, I'm not saying this to try to frighten you. Um, I'm saying this to try to uh, open your eyes up a little bit. Uh, because if you think you aren't in a battlefield, you're, you're going to go down. You're going to go out there and you're going to get exhausted. You're going to get mowed down by the enemy. Um, a lot of us don't even seem to care that we're being attacked. We're too busy with our own lives. We don't even care. We, don't, we, don't, we stopped caring about our sins. We stopped caring about the way we uh, act. And it's like we don't care that we're living in a battlefield. We say things like, well, God knows I love him, that kind of thing. God knows I'm, you know, I'm forgiven, that kind of thing. Um, well, God is fighting for you in this battle, and you're giving yourself over to the enemy. You're walking every single day. You wake up and walk right into the enemy camp. And the enemy's going, this is a victory. This guy, this guy keeps <laughs> giving me victory after victory. And you come home, you're exhausted, and you're wondering, you're falling to sin over and over again. And it's like you are a willing prisoner of war because you won't wake up to the fact that there's a battle going on, and you need to prepare yourself for this. Um, we go on completely unprepared and unprotected for what's going on. Um, I gotta, what do you think when you see this picture here? What do you think when you see this picture? You think, oh, it's a picnic. That's right. It's nice and relaxing. Uh, it's some place I can go and maybe, maybe some of you are thinking, oh, gosh, I'm going to get sticky. It's going to be bad. The kids are going to knock over everything. But I see that and I think, oh, this is a nice relaxing time. We'll, we'll go out and we'll have a nice picnic. But you know what an ant thinks when he sees that picture? An ant thinks, this is it, man. It's go time. It's battle time. Let's go and take, and take, <laughs> let's take them down. Um, a lot of you were really hoping that life was a picnic, that life is a picnic. You were really hoping that you would come in Sunday and you would hear pastor say something like, life is just a picnic, and uh, we don't need to worry about anything. Um, all you need to do, though, is look around at your life and see that it's not a picnic. We need to stop thinking of a picnic like uh, it's a relaxing thing and start realizing this is a picnic in the middle of a battlefield, if anything. Um, just because you've got a nice, comfortable life doesn't mean there's a spiritual battle going on around you. We need to prepare for the reality that we're uh, living in. Uh, we need to have Jesus' mindset that God's kingdom, the kingdom that I'm a part of, is under attack. And if I am a part of that kingdom, then I'm under attack as well. Uh, and when we join God, sometimes things don't get exactly easier. Um, we're having a baptism today. Well, it, it, for any of you who have been walking with the Lord for a while, you know that the baptism doesn't just fix everything in your life. You know, the baptism, that's when really the battle kind of begins. Because now that you're living for God, uh, the, the enemy just doesn't say, well, all right, I guess I lost that one. No, he's going he's gonna to keep going at you. And sometimes he goes at you even harder. Uh, you're going to be facing uh, temptations that you never faced before. Um, when I became a Christian, I, I, it started getting really hard because the sins that I was doing, I never had a problem with doing before. But now that I'm at least following Jesus, now I think, oh, I can't do this anymore. And now all of a sudden, here's this struggle that, that shows up. Here's this battle that I feel like I'm a part of. Um, if we're going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about living in this battlefield uh, for the next few weeks, and we're going to be talking about how we're supposed to fight in this battlefield. Um, but for now, I put there in the conclusion, just the one thing you need to know for now, what you need to stop doing is stop fighting alone. This is the conclusion today. Stop fighting alone. You're exhausted uh, you're disheartened, you're falling into sin, you're depressed, you're coming home every day uh, beat. Um, you need to start saying to yourself, I'm under attack. Um, uh, you know, why am I feeling this way? Well, you've got to realize you're under attack. But here's some good f news for you. Um, you just need to open your eyes to see that there's also the armies of the Lord that are here uh, fighting for you. Um, we're in a battle, but it's not an equal battle. They are rebelling against God. The enemy is rebelling against God. This is not an equal battle like God's uh, hoping someday he'll win somehow. No, um, with Jesus' death and resurrection, he made all the weapons of the enemy powerless. And we're living uh, not in a battle that's uh, uncertain. We're living in a battle that's already decided. And what we need to do is line up with that winning side because God really is upholding the entire thing. And it's just that the enemy is rebelling against him. But you've been taking way too much fire out there. You've been going into the battlefield totally unprepared. Um, and if you find yourself defeated time and time again, what you need to do is stop going into the battlefield and fighting by yourself. 
God's the one who's won this war. He's the one who's made the weapons of the enemy powerless. Um, you need to fight behind him. And when you wake up in the morning, you need to realize, I, got, I need to be behind you today because I'm taking fire out there. I've been walking right into the battlefield and I'm, I'm getting blown to bits. Um, we're outnumbered and we're outgunned. If we're going to go out there by ourselves, we're going to get chewed up. We're going to get thrown into a prisoner of war camp out there. Uh, we need to take a break. You need to take a break. Let Jesus fight for you. If you're exhausted, if you're defeated all, all, all the time, um, like I mentioned before a couple weeks ago, you come to Jesus and Jesus says, I'll give you rest. <laughs> come to me and you'll find rest for your souls. If you're not finding rest for your souls right now, then you're not coming to Jesus. You're finding rest. You're trying to find rest in a battlefield somewhere. You're trying to find rest by, by the enemy sometimes himself. You need to start asking God for different things. When you pray to the Lord, uh, say to him, Lord, protect me. Lord, rescue me. Lord, I've been fighting out here by myself and I shouldn't have been. Um, will you bail me out, God? And, if, and we need to stop walking into the enemy camp. Quit sitting down as a, in the, as a prisoner of war. God says, I've, I've won this battle and here you go walking right into his prison. Take shelter in the arms of God this week. Let him guide you. Let him protect you. And let him fight for you. Amen? Let's pray.